Welcome to episode 26 of the Game Session Podcast. I'm your host, Jose, slash the Seth Rokage. Uh, this week, I am joined by Sarah Blaine, as well as special guest slash uh, patron, uh, Ramen. How's everyone doing this week? Doing good. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Sorry about that. <laughs> Don't lie. This, this has been like the longest freaking two weeks of my life not doing a show because what was it the, the episodes from two weeks ago we didn't do because of uh scheduling reasons and then last week i was getting packed and ready to go to disneyland like literally the next morning so just has it really happen. been like three weeks yeah it's 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 been three weeks since the last episode Damn, it feels so like long. a million years <laughs> but um i am so fucking incredibly happy to be back here i've been looking forward to this all week um it's very therapeutic especially given with the pandemic and whatnot uh so very grateful to be able to do this and be able to talk to you guys um what was i gonna say oh yes my usual uh at the top of the show blurb that i have forgot forgotten to do because i haven't done this in three weeks so muscle memory has gone you don't hear it Wait, Sarah, do you not hear anything? No, I do. No, 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 my burp. Said, do you apologize oh, for I'm sorry. Did you hear it? I was Shit. trying to just let the show go <laughs> on, but apologize to anybody <laughs> watching that may have been grossed. <laughs> I thought something. Oh, I'm so confused. I thought something was going on with the stream. I'm like, oh shit, I gotta stop. <laughs> no, no, no. You gotta do your blurb. Oh, we shit. distracted you. Do Damn the blurb. It. Do the blurb. Um, Game Session Podcast is filmed live here on Twitch at 6.30 p.m. PST on Sundays. You can find it later on podcast services, as well as on YouTube as full episodes and individually cut up segments. Um, yeah, you can find all the links for that at, uh, down below in the link tree. You can find everyone's Twitter ads on here. Please go ahead and support everyone and whatnot. Um, before we get started, Blaine, do you want to go ahead and uh, take the lead on the... Uh, yes, I do. So, um, I mean, this isn't something that only started recently, but this has been something that has been more and more in the public eye as in the last few weeks. Um, the, I'm, of course, talking about the Palestinian occupation and apartheid and straight up genocide being carried out by the Israeli government. Um, I know there's a lot of there's a lot of both faux and sincere confusion on uh, some people's parts of they think oh well isn't this a both sides issue isn't this like isn't the isn't the i i don't know if i want to pick a side and all that bullshit i just gonna boil it down for you as simply as i can um the israeli government is a fascist police state it is it is carrying out acts of genocide acts of, it is carrying out war crimes um i literally am having trouble putting together all the words i want to use because it's just so horrendously terrible and has been going on for far too long i as a jewish person um seeing what what is considered to be like you know the jewish state and the jewish nation when it's really not that also to be honest it's it's really not but to see that essentially them care that government carrying out things that I know that my ancestors fleed when my ancestors had uh, fled Russia and the pogroms in the turn of the 18th or 19th century. I forget which. I'm sorry. Um, I just off the top of my head what the proper number is. Um, that being said, I think even though this is a gaming podcast, even though this is you know fun whatever talks, I we need. I think it's something that needs to be brought up and needs to be addressed. That everyone on this podcast believes in a free Palestine and believes in an end to the occupation and the apartheid and the genocide. Um, and that being said, I'm going to be dropping a few links in the chat so that you can um, use those to your advantage. There, That is going to include um, charities that you can donate to as well as other things you can do because, let's be honest, just donating to, do donating to charities is not, not going to be enough on its own um i'm also going to be linking these on to the thread of tonight's uh of tonight's uh show i, th I think we're losing here, here a little I just bit might by need the a way minute after i'm done um linking these in this thing oh what what did i what did you lose me on uh your voice just cut out for like a split second I'm 
Oh, okay. As long as as long as I, all I said was that I was going to be attaching all these links to the um, tonight's the tweet you put out just for the announcing the show and everything tonight, and I'm going to try and re- like retweet those as as often as I can. Um, that's that's pretty much all I had to say. Just um, don't don't look at this as oh well. I don't know. Someone told me that Israel needs to defend themselves. This is not. There's no such thing as. Uh, a, 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 a government police state is defending themselves when they're launching rockets at innocent people and the innocent people are throwing rocks at the police because they're fed up with being being put under an apartheid state. There's no comparison. And I didn't... There, I'm sorry. I, just, I, I don't have anything else to say on it. Uh, just listen to the Palestinian people. Listen to the people who are trying to get the word out about this something needs to be done about this yep and Thanks. look at the links i'm putting in chat it will, will have more and more um things you can do aside from just donating thanks for uh, taking the lead on that blaine and uh yeah please follow those links and uh i'm sure that uh at least blaine and i will be talking about this on twitter just as it continues um it, mm-hmm. yeah um I've been, was, I've been retweeting those uh threads that have the credible places to uh donate and what else people can do as well so uh with with that uh let, let's do the world's best segue ramen who oh i know shit i forgot one thing from my <laughs> usual thing damn it uh i need to thank patrons so big thank you to sly and uh fourth <laughs> big boss who was a new patron uh and also Ramen, who is here? I can thank you personally this time. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> not a problem. Happy to support you. But You're doing um, good things and surrounded by good people. So, thank it's you. An easy thing to do for me. I appreciate you, man. But um, I was I was going to say if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone on the show, but as as you can tell, Ramen may not, in fact, actually be a sentient uh, cup noodles. Um, <laughs> but if you just want to go ahead and maybe introduce yourself in terms of like what what games are you passionate about? Are there any topics in uh, within the industry or or what interests you generally? I guess. Yeah. So I go by Ramen. Uh, keep myself pseudonymous just to maintain a healthy separation from social media and real life. But I'm a dad. I'm Asian American. Um, and I enjoy all kinds of games. I've been gaming since, uh, well, I guess my first gaming experience is I went to the airport in 1994, I think, to pick up my uncle with my father, and my uncle's from Korea, and he actually had a laptop on it with probably the most child-inappropriate game he could possibly have, which was Duke Nukem 3D at the time, and that kicked off my gaming experience, as it were. From there, I... You know, enjoy RTS, shooters, all kinds of stuff. Most recently, I'm really enjoying Resident Evil 8. I spoiled the hell out of myself because I couldn't oh, no. wait to even finish it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and when I'm not enjoying the flavor of the month new release, I'm probably playing Destiny 2 more than is healthy. So if anybody wants to ever hit me up about tips or tricks or... I think the show is just... I think the show is just slowly attracting Destiny 2 <laughs> addicts. We got Kyle on last time, I believe, and now we got you. Yep, but yeah, I, I hopped on Twitter several years ago because I was bored at work. and, and <laughs> Kind of blossomed from there, but I follow all kinds of gaming personalities, probably too much to my chagrin. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all kinds of other stuff. But uh, my day job right now is I'm a civil engineer for some NASA related program that I probably shouldn't speak too publicly about, but yeah, that's a the short and skinny on me. And thank you very so much. You are for working me. on the massive mass effect of re- relays. I can neither can confirm <laughs> nor deny the existence of element zero. Jealous. <laughs> Point being uh, T TLDR. Um, Raman is a smart motherfucker. <clears throat> You are I have my moments. <laughs> <laughs> and I know in the uh, in the Twitter thread, we were trying to figure out like coordinating. Um, 
like time zone changes and we're just like fuck math is hard i'm just like man if, if roman's having trouble with this everyone else is just screwed <laughs> oh yeah that, i may do software and engineering and all that jazz but i need a graphing calculator to do addition and subtraction so <laughs> nobody feel bad about their math skills because i am bottom barrel <laughs> Um, let's see, at the top of the show, and maybe I'll even word it like this, we are going to have, and this might even, I don't want to say awkward, in, in a fun sense, this is going to be awkward for our guests here, it's time for not even annual, uh, wait, fuck, when did we start the show, back in October last year? I don't even remember, man, it's been so long. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. Anyway, I, was, uh, I came on after. Almost kind of somewhat not really quite there yet annual performance review of everyone on the show uh so for uh let's see i put out a tweet earlier uh saying who is the uh quote-unquote best opinion haver of the game session podcast uh i did not include myself because that would not be fair to everyone else because i because i would obviously win um no that'd just be shitty of me to do that um but so yeah, we I go in and put out a poll just because I'm curious. Um, uh, Mesa was winning for the first I want to say like two hours or so. He had like a pretty clear undisputed lead, but Mesa came in at and this is with uh, I can refresh if this is the most current. Uh, Mesa out of a total of 31 votes, Mesa came in at 35.5 percent as the best opinion haver. Uh, Sarah has a little bit of a lead on him at 38.7%. God, really? People actually enjoy my shit? <laughs> uh, Blaine came in at 22.6%, the, uh, the Al Gore of, of the vote. I'm demanding and a recount wait, tomorrow. Please, please warn before you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, know I voted at least three times, so... I, I, like, um, I like getting a feel. I put out a lot of polls, and uh, this is a this is a crime. Corey came in at three point two, and I don't know if it's just like the frequency of everyone being on the show, but Corey deserves better than that. Corey is a sweet boy. He absolutely does. Corey does deserve better. So but I'm I'm feeling incredibly fucking sappy this week for whatever reason. Not I'm not even sad. I'm just feeling the feels. Um, so quick performance review thing I, I i said it earlier to mesa personally he couldn't make it on the show because of work conflicts and whatnot um mesa is one of the hardest working people i know and he doesn't get anywhere near the recognition he deserves um and he has he has beyond like the skill set required to go and get opportunities out in this industry and I know it's going to eventually come to him, but it should be coming sooner than later. And I just love that dude. He's, he's an amazing 10 out of 10. Um, took the time out of his day to try to teach me uh, Street Fighter. I'm shit at it, but he cares enough. So love that guy. Um, we'll just go down the list, I guess. Uh, Sarah, you're enthusiasm is beyond freaking infectious and you're able to turn every single show into like a high energy drive and that is a very special thing that you're able to do please i already took one shot i'm already fucked up please. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a never boring week with you on thank um, you i really really Co appreciate it Corey, my my boy who deserves much more than, than single digit percentages <laughs> Um, I think him in particular out of this entire pandemic, like we were friends before we, we like, like semi kept in touch after college and whatnot. Um, I think our friendship has, has like grown the most from doing the show and just like hanging out, um, even outside of that, um, uh, Corey's just an amazing person. He, we, it is very hard to have a hangout session where we're not just busting up laughing and he just genuinely cares about you and just one of the best friends I could ask for, especially with just uh, recent stuff and whatnot. I'm not going to cry, fucking promise. Somewhat, semi. 
Um, but but Corey's uh, got my back, so thankful to him for that. And uh, Blaine, I, th- I freaking adore you. you uh, I second that. You you are uh. you are one of my best friends, and um, I think I think I texted to you earlier because like after I put up the poll, I'm just like. I'm I'm not trying to play favorites. I love all of my podcast children evenly. I th- think I and en- but shit, how am I going to put this? Everyone is my favorite to bring on the show, but out of the favorites of the favorites, I enjoy having Blaine on the show because you bring a level of um what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of it. Stalling for time by saying other words while I can think of it. You, you're, big, big words, big your, words. Your, your logic and reasoning behind formulating your arguments, it's always uh, eloquent and, and coherent. And that where even if we fundamentally disagree on like the outcome, we can see where the logic train came from. And it's always completely rational. And I think in that regard, you and I are are um are like two sides of the same coin where where sometimes you don't agree but it's because we're traveling down that same train of thought but just in different directions and um you are one of the smartest people i know well shit i mean half the time i don't really know what i'm talking about but that it means a lot i mean in all sincerity like as someone who half the time i kind of just talk out my ass but i still do try to at least make a good point if i have somewhat of an idea what i'm talking about the other half of the time i do put a lot of thought into what i want to bring to the table so it means a lot to hear you say that um yeah but blainer is robbed in the vote you got el gord i'm sorry blaine you were 100 <laughs> robbed does that make sarah the the george w no oh, god, oh my no. god I dude i'm already her. i'm already speechless over the fact that people actually like my gross ass opinions like I'm already speechless. Like I honestly, I have no words, and it is. I'm incredibly thankful to be here. I'm incredibly th- thankful that people actually want to listen to me because I really never thought people did. So it honestly means an incredibly a lot to me. So thank you, thank you for giving me the honor to be a part of this, and for being here with some of my very good friends and just like. Also, can we just think like ramen really fast? Because like I never like, and I'm sure I'm sure all of us can completely agree with the same thing. I've never had someone like almost every tweet that I have that, that <laughs> I've done, and I feel like that that meme where that guy is standing on the roof and he's playing like a like a techno song, and there's like two dudes on the like ground just like just like dancing <laughs> and like, just, like cheering for him, and that's like literally the like personification of that meme, and I'm just like incredibly. We're all incredibly thankful for you, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I said, you guys are good people, and I see you express yourselves in the most honest and and thoughtful ways on Twitter. I know it's silly to say on Twitter, right? But also the way you guys carry yourselves there, you know, having a forward facing identity there and being able to shout proudly what you believe in and the things you stand for, it's incredibly inspiring to me. And the least I can do is, you know, shower you with probably more notifications about likes that you probably want. But, you know, you <laughs> guys are all good people. It. Yeah, and you guys should be very proud of who you are as people. This is the uh, Don't Try to Cry podcast. Please, I get <laughs> drunk so easily. Stop. <laughs> Hashtag white girl wasted episode. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and jump into some uh, some games. Um, so just some slight changes to the show format. We're just going to go in and push up um, new releases up to the top. And yeah, then we're just going to go from there. Uh, who here has played Returnal? Uh, I have. You I have. have. I have. I only did like four hours, but I have. I- I'm not privileged enough to own a PS5. You just gotta wait outside a Target at like two in the morning and then nope, fight off crazy that. moms. No. You, gotta, you have <laughs> to fight off that. trading card game people. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! I forgot about that. Uh, that I mean, Target's now banning trading cards because <laughs> they just straight up took them out. 
<laughs> I'm Some fine with them. trading card game people. I'm tired of trading card game scalpers. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, true. Shit. Um, so I have Returnal. My girlfriend got it for me for my birthday. <laughs> But knowing how shit my backlog is at the moment, I'm just like, I'm not going to be able to get through this in like a timely manner. So uh, Mesa actually has my copy. Um, He's not here today to talk about it. I guess we'll talk about it maybe next week. Um, But yeah, what are your thoughts on it, sir? So I should probably preface this by saying that I'm not a roguelike person. It's not my favorite genre. Uh, I think the only I don't even think I've enjoyed roguelikes as much as like more as much as anybody here. Um, but what got me interested in Returnal is the fact that it's obviously like a it's a female main character. It's it, it's an older protagonist, which we don't normally see, save for like old grizzled white dudes. So it was really interesting. Um, and just the world of it, and also the fact that it's fucking gorgeous. Like, it's an incredibly pretty game. Uh, it runs pretty good on the PlayStation 5. Um, the powers are incredibly cool. The whole idea of, even if you die, you keep the, like, character upgrades that y- you get. So, like, you I think you get, like, a melee weapon within the first couple hours, and even if you die, you still keep that. So it's not like it strips everything away from from you. And another thing that I really like about the game is the fact that the story is told to you sort of in a Hades sort of way. So even if you die, um, the story will come at you a little bit faster. It's like almost every death brings in more of the of the story, which I'm a really big fan of. It it was incredibly interesting for the four hours that I did play. I did have to stop it because I'm playing like other stuff, but. And also the oh my god the difficulty and the bosses get fucking nuts, <laughs> and it and you you don't know anxiety until you go to a boss and you have like no health, and then the boss is like some weird Lovecraftian horror that has like skin wings, and you're like ah, <laughs> you're like and, I didn't uh, sign up for this. <laughs> In terms of difficulty, and I saw Jeff Grubb uh, tweeting about this a while ago. We had a little back and forth. Um, is, do you feel like some of the difficulty can stem from the fact that it's a um, just from like even the camera perspective, how it's kind of like tight in there? Because like my issue with Hades was even though it's isometric and you can see ev- like everything like within your peripheral vision, just like from that view, mm-hmm. I had a hard time with Hades because since the camera is so was so um far pulled back that I had a hard time like reading enemy animations like if they're getting ready to prime for an attack so my initial thought um for someone who hasn't played it I was like oh if the camera's pulled further in it's just over the shoulder you are able to see it but that kind of also brings in the issue of enemies sneaking up behind you which apparently is a very big issue and would that so, even be something that would be like remedied if you're like playing with a mouse where you can just like flip around in a split second? So from when I played, there was some indication if there was an enemy behind you. So if there was something off screen attacking you, there would be some sort of ring in, in indication telling you that, that there was something coming from that direction. And I found that that helped very much, but it didn't show you how close something was. So I would think, oh, I can dodge as soon as this ring comes up. I dodge and something still hits. So it's like a weird, like, it tells you when something's behind you, but it doesn't give you, like, a straight reticule. You still have to, like, get the timing of it. Yeah, and I mean, the best way I can describe it is how... I'm gonna compare it to how Nier Replicant and Nier Automata does it, which is, yes, it's it's third person, but a lot of the boss fights and a lot of the enemy encounters, you can see what's in front of you, and you can see the, like, little, like, ball um ball things coming towards you but you can tell when something's close to you or not you have a chance to dodge you have a chance to like attack and like take them out before they hit you while in returnal they stay like some of the times they would just pass through things so i wouldn't have a chance to hide behind a tree but like normally i would um i just feel like in returnal the way that it's so fast paced and how close it is to you i do kind of have to agree with that Is that, like, stop, like, there will be a lot of enemies in a single room, and you have to literally, like, micromanage. Like, are you going to take out what's farthest from from you, or do you have a shotgun right right now? I mean, you have to get close. It's like, it's, I'm not a fan of the big micromanagement, especially when you enter a a room and, like, five enemies spawn. 
and they're different types of enemies, so you have to like remember what each enemy does. So it's like that panic of just like, uh, okay, which one's gonna kill me first? Which one do I have to take out first? And I mean, the game has a reactive AI to it, so if you die to a specific enemy, um, the game will in in your next run through may do something different to that enemy. It may lower the damage that it that 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 it does to you. It may stop it from doing a specific attack that like fucked with you. Um and it will um it will sometimes not spawn that enemy depending on how much that you die from it. Um mm-hmm. so it it has little like difficulty choices like that, but because uh, I'm currently playing Hades on my Switch. I'm having a blast, by the way. Meg wrecked my ass today, which was not fun. But um, the one thing I like about Hades is in, in that type of roguelike, you know why you died. Either I'm a dumbass that ran into a spike spike trap, or I d- wasn't paying attention to what was attacking me. When I play R- Returnal, when I die, I almost don't feel like I didn't learn anything, because either the death was kind of bullshit and the game kind of stunlocked me, or... I the game hadn't given me anything good to use mm-hmm. gun wise. What one issue I've so. seen, like even from pacing, that seems like kind of antithetical to um to roguelikes or rogue. Ro- Quick segue: What the fuck is the difference between a rogue light and a rogue like? Not even I fucking know. know anymore. It, there there is some know. proper distinction that I've heard, but I just it just passed over my head. But um, what, one issue I've, I've seen that's like antithetical to like that design is that uh, I guess like once you clear enemies out, you can still like explore the map for stuff. Yes. Whereas yeah. like in Hades, there's not really much to explore and even stuff in Spelunky where if you hang out on a map too long, like a ghost will pop up and uh, chase you around. So it's kind of like pushing you to go forward, whereas it feel, yeah. it feel like there's a lot of dead air in uh, So like in Returnal. the way that it works in Hades that I really like or no, uh, Returnal that I really but like, is it has sort of a Metroidvania thing to it, because in every area, so the, so the, for those who don't know, the levels are procedurally generated, so when you die and you go through the area again, it's going to be different, but every area has specific item, like, key item only items that you can get, so I'm pretty sure there's like, I think there's a grappling hook in it, I just, yes, yes, there is a grappling hook in it, um, there's some items that require you to have the grappling hook. Well, you don't get that until like the second or third world. So when you go through the area again, you can use all the grappling hook lo- locations and get the upgrades that are up there. Or some require you to have the like jump upgrade too. So it's like it has sort of a Metroidvania style to it. But I'm also there's I should let pe- people know that they say that there's accessibility options to it. But as far as I know, the only accessibility options are um, color colorblind, if I remember correctly. Someone please correct me if I'm wrong. But there, then there's also like changing the size of subtitles, which is fine and great because definitely people need that. But at the same time, I feel like they could have done something really crazy with this, what a lot of roguelikes don't, which is added more accessibility features like having a difficulty option or having a kind of like how Hades has with its god with its god mode that I've been using to great a, a, a effect to where like every time you die your defense goes up or you get more health or something like that because that would make me maybe want to continue going through it because again the difficulty jumps very heavily when you pass through different areas in Returnal and you keep your health and the guns that you were using so you can jump into a new area and the gun that you're using just feels like a fucking nerf blaster. I think, like, um, like, I think to build off, nothing. I think to build off that, I think we can all kind of, kind of just like even generally agree that like, because this conversation is so applicable to like, uh, the souls born series and, um, just like mm-hmm. games of that ilk It's just games having accessibility options and difficulty options is not an active detriment to the uh, quote unquote intended experience uh, it harms you in no way to have those in there so every game should have them um but what one specific point i want to talk about on here which is i'm I think so, I su- gonna say. I, I, i'm surprised slash not surprised that so many people are like rallying behind it is because it, it doesn't is, save <laughs> there is there is no save feature 
in Returnal, yeah. Uh, we are in our godforsaken year of 2021, and you don't put a save feature into a game, which then the developers go, that's what rest mode is for, and then your game crashes in rest mode. Like, no! <laughs> like, no! Like, 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 on one hand, I'm just like, not having a save feature does not add difficulty. That's that's literally just a fucking inconvenience on, like, runs that can apparently, like, last up to, like, two, three hours, like, the, like, the further you get in. Yeah. Um, so I I think it's dumb that people are like rallying behind just no saving part is difficult. I'm like what whatever, dude. I um, thought saving I think is Jim a Sterling said, fucking thing. Like I think Jim Sterling said it best, where it's like this was this isn't even having the the whole like not having a save thing isn't even a fucking difficulty issue. It's just not the fact that the get good fucking like mindset d- d- dipshits are making this like a difficulty thing is just so stupid. It's just a game design flaw that shouldn't be. Like, every every roguelike and rogue li- roguelite or whatever, like, has this as a feature in some way. Um, like, like, Enter the Gungeon has it as a feature. And even if you don't want to ever, like, do that, if you personally want to just play through it and never use the save feature, let's say your game crashes and you lose an entire floor and Enter the Gungeon, it knows that, and you continue as if you saved. And you don't lose your progress. So, like, yeah, no, it's not a difficulty thing. It's just, it's just, it's an oversight, which I guess they've already said. I, I feel like they did say that they were going to look, they were looking into a way to implement the save system. The fact that they didn't think about it ahead of time is stupid it's, as hell. It's such a but, crazy freaking oversight. Well, it yeah, just did uh, strike me that all the Twitter discourse I saw about Returnal was safe states it wasn't the actual difficulty of it wasn't any of the game design portions of it it was people crying out to the twitter gods saying oh dear god please don't update please don't reset my playstation (laughs) for the love of all that is holy and nothing else about the game so yeah Mm -hmm. it seems like a pretty massive oversight on their part if if i if i have to play this game knowing that someone else might be having fun with it in a way that I think isn't fun. I just can't have fun. That ruins my fun. Get f- <laughs> get the fuck over yourself. Get the fuck over yourself. Um, what one little side point that it struck me as weird is, and I know like the PS5 specifically has been having some weird, um, rust mode issues where you'll turn it back on and it, it's it's like not bricked, but it's just acting up. You have to like, uh pulled power cord and whatnot it, it, it's a bit weirder compared to yeah. the ps4 but just like s- such a central tenet of the way that i play games is i love suspend modes i love rest modes ever since the psp brought it on i'm just like yep this is how i'm gonna play fucking games so ps4 ps5 um xbox one switch w- whatever like if it has a rest mode i will always use it because it's convenient as shit um like that that's like so centrally a core tenet of why i want a series x because you can suspend like up to or i guess ramen you know you can suspend like up to five games right it's pretty amazing i was playing yeah several different games yeah so for the so for that feature only some games support it not all of them it's the overwhelming majority though isn't it overwhelming majority do i know for a fact that outriders doesn't um probably because it's online yeah but but i know uh, i've tried to do it with devil may cry 5 a special edition and it sometimes won't do it so i Mm -hmm. think it depends on the game that you're using i don't know ramen if you've come across that yeah every game that i've played is acted normally and quite well honestly like i was able to jump seamlessly between assassin's creed odyssey and then halo some other games too so to me that's actually a pretty huge selling point of the xbox series stuff is being able to do that pretty seamlessly without any noticeable downtime mm. or issues whereas with the playstation 5 i'm rolling the dice and, <laughs> yeah. um uh, yeah. cory pointed <laughs> out uh, he says in chat jose was shocked by the fact i actually close my games down on max when i'm done playing i do because <laughs> Like, I don't know, it's just weird to me, because, like, that's just how I've played games for, like, freaking, I guess, 10 plus years at this point. Uh, 
I don't know, like time estimate, whatever. But it's just it's just weird to me that people got out of their way to like manually close games. Like I, I just, maybe I just assumed that the overwhelming majority of people would just also use it. But I guess not. I guess I'm wrong. <laughs> um, and, the, and then just I don't even think we really want to touch on it because review score discourse is always fucking stupid. People getting mad over low scores, high scores, whatever. Unless anyone else has their two cents I want to put in. It's stupid. The only two cents... <laughs> it is stupid. The only two cents I have to put on that is that I can understand on some level the the be, being upset. I mean, if we're even just going beyond, like, oh, the thing I like isn't being recognized. That pisses me off. Like, no, everybody feels that on some level, but we normal people push that down and go, it's okay for other people to not like the thing I like. That doesn't make me my enjoyment of it ma- not matter. But I do understand the fact that like the way the game industry, games industry is now that someone sees the Metacritic score go down on a game they really like, their mind goes, oh shit, those developers might, because of the fact that so much is tied into as far as bonuses, possibilities of sequels, possibilities of just furthering an IP in general, the studio staying open even can sometimes hinge on a matter of like what single digit differences in Metacritic. I think the problem is that people's people then placing that that ire people placing that upset feeling at the feet of like games journalists who actually are putting the time in and doing their job and reviewers putting the time in and like trying to give their honest opinion when instead they should be putting it at the fucking feet of the corporations that they're just constantly sucking the dicks of like complain to Sony about like, Hey, this game shouldn't be at risk of like never seeing a sequel because it got a Metacritic of like 70 versus another game that gets a 74 and you guys decide, okay, let's get a sequel like, or whatever. And you could just apply that to every single one of these publishers. Don't get mad at reviewers. I mean, and get mad at a reviewer who actually maybe does do a shitty thing or is shown to be like a shill in some legitimately like shitty way. Cause it does happen every once in a while, but don't do this bullshit. where like, but brain, fu- you can, you can trust them. They have a secret labs chair. <laughs> but listen, every hey, every, every but you day haven't done a review, have, Sarah. That's the difference. Every day I have oh to God. see some new <laughs> asshole post that joked picture of Jeff Grubb and go and gotcha, and then I just roll my eyes and I'm just like, y'all, I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of this fucking blaming journalists because game review scores are bad. Like, stop, just stop it. Yeah. Any thoughts, Roman? Yeah, I, you know, I, I struggled with game review scores when I started kind of writing my own reviews when I was younger, because that's what people go right to, right? They want to see the score, they want to see the outcome, they don't read the context of, of your review at all. And the more you boil it down to that review score, the more you prioritize it, the more your actual journalism or writing gets pushed to the side. And as admirable as it is to get rid of that, I could see a lot of publications being enslaved to giving out that review score because that drives the clicks. So I, I'm I'm with Blaine on this 100 percent that it's it's bullshit to sum up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's go ahead and move on over to uh, Mass Effect. Who who here has played the uh, Legendary Edition? Sarah and I. It me. Oh, you have also. Yep. Nice. Uh, cu- out of curious curiosity, what platform is everyone playing on? PlayStation Five, Xbox, and I guess PC here. So we have we have the full table here. Can I can I just say it is still so weird to me seeing Mass Effect playable on a Sony console? Because like, oh, like I because so <laughs> uh, like one and two launched like exclusively on Xbox and I think it was like a year after on both of those it came to PC. Didn't they and release so, so, the trilogy on PS3 eventually? When they it, when did. It, they yeah, like put they it did. in this nice fancy collection that had like when a it, nice case on when it. When the series first came to PS3, <laughs> it was only two at first, and so so you couldn't play Mass Effect one. So there was like a. There was a comic, a digital comic sp- that they specifically made for that PS3 version 
we can go through and like make some of the decisions that you would have otherwise made in Mass Effect one. Um, it was actually pretty cool. But yeah, every time I see like a Mass Effect uh, gameplay or screenshot, and I see like the the PlayStation buttons. I'm, like there's just a reptile part of my brain that's just like that isn't right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's so actually what, what what drove my decision to get it on Xbox, honestly, because <laughs> <laughs> my brain is so hardwired to playing it on there. I I can't divorce my idiot brain from that. Yeah. I, uh, I, the same thing happened to me with um, the Spyro Reignited trilogy, where I'm just like, I can, oh, my Xbox is quieter. I have a PC that could run it at 60. I'm just like, but it would feel so fucking wrong to play to not play Spyro on, on a PlayStation for me. <laughs> <laughs> Got to press that X button, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Roman, you want to go and give your thoughts overall on the Legendary Edition? I will be right back. Yeah, I, if I may say, Mass Effect 1 has not aged well to me. <laughs> no, it hasn't. Oh my god, <laughs> it, it is painful. You can tell that they built it off the bones of Knights of the Old Republic. That's, that's kind of the, the feeling that I get, because I forgot that when you're shooting bullets, you're still rolling a dice. You know, it's not yeah, an actual... Yeah, I noticed that too. Like, yep. I'll fire at something, and hitting a guess, like, head-on... And I only do like a little bit of damage, and I'm like, "Yep." I'm like, "I upgraded this. Like, this is upgraded pretty good." Exactly. Yeah, and bless them for going the more action route in two and three. But I'm like, I love one. It, it's my nostalgia brain speaking, but it's technically my favorite. But my God, I want it to be over with so soon so I can it's, get to two. <laughs> yeah, um, I. I I hit this spot in it last last night where it was like find this elevator and I was looking up a guide. It's like oh it's between this area and this area and I'm in between that area and I'm like where the fuck's the elevator and it's like oh no no it's in between before the elevator before the elevator and I'm like <laughs> I'm like what the fuck design is this. I'm like, yep. oh, I do this, and then I get there, and I'm like, <sighs> um, I, I know at can least I for me, it's paid now, so I can leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know yeah. uh, at least for me, I've I've only played the uh, the first mission like before we started um, getting ready and whatnot, and just like yeah, overall presentation wise, like yeah, they they put new character models. It's not uh, early 360 potato face status, uh, which is nice. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but it like all all the, the jank Bioware's still feels there. there. It's, yeah, it still feels off. Um, the, the the combat doesn't feel great. Like I, typically, Mass Effect two and three, I love playing those on the hardest difficulty because it turns into like a really nice tactical shooter where you're having to like yep. manage everyone's skills using uh, specific weaknesses against like armor barriers and shields. Mm -hmm. And it, it I I love the combat of two and three. I think it's it's perfect as is, but. I don't know. One just feels like a slog to go through, and oh yeah, uh, it's you're playing a digital Dungeons and Dragons in space, and it's <laughs> all rolling the dice you know, for it's, all. It's your weird to, to specifically <laughs> go on that. It I I can feel like the old uh, Bioware writing in it, where <laughs> I'm just like, this is literally a. Uh, a middle age fantasy novel, but it, that just happens to take a space. Like you could, you could take everything about this game and just take the sci-fi aspects and just put, but in the middle ages, I'm just like, yeah, yeah this just screams like a D and D campaign. And it's, it, I, I kind of like it that you can see those, see those uh, strings there. My uh, also favorite part is just like some of the voice acting just doesn't work now. It, it's like, really oh my. jilted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's like my favorite and people point this out so um it is my spoiler my favorite is when you talk to Caden about his about his a backstory and he's like yeah we were all experimented on as kids we were all put through uh mental torture and all of us pretty died but i just get my grades now and your shepherd's like good to know Caden. thank you and i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> i'm like no like, he literally just said he's mentally tortured most likely has ptsd but he just gets migraines and my shepherd's like thanks for letting me know Caden." and i'm like shepherd what? had to go <laughs> so shepherd terrible go. Like, and plus it does my pet peeve with games that let you choose dialogue options is when the dialogue option says one thing and your character says something else like oh, where it's like oh i pick the very nice sounding i only do it for you Caden, and shepherd goes 
I don't do it often. Thank you for asking. And I'm so, like, that's not what I'm doing. To be fair, it still does it a lot better than LA Noir. There is some extreme stuff in there where you're telling like an old lady to go shove it up her ass. Because I because I think I'm sounding like a good person and then my shepherd points a gun at someone and I'm like, no. Oh! Um, well, that's how I feel about talking to the space racist too. Because yeah. Oh, don't name nu- her right nuke, here. nuke the space racist. Oh yeah, every single time. All the time. She killed my toad the first time I played back in 2007. I, I wasn't having that. <laughs> it's just like, I get that that's like old dialogue choice design, but I think it also happens in 2 and 3, and doesn't happen in Inquisition whatsoever, Dragon Age. So I feel like they learned from that, but at the same time, it's just like, this sucks! Like, I, I think I'm saying a nice thing, I think I'm flirting with this very hot space spaceman, and then I'm just like, I have to go, and I'm like, no! No, the, I, I'm totally with you, the Mass Effect trilogy has this weird disassociation problem with your main character and that always felt so weird to me that you really are the shellless motionless empty avatar in mass mm-hmm. effect and things are just happening around you also you and, don't blink either so that also yeah it's a little freaky right? as a um <laughs> as a quick little segue before i go to the to the other thing like i'm just playing paragon so i'm not choosing like any neutral or, or renegade options but it is so weird like once you get um the space racist on your ship i, I will not refer to the space racist by name good name uh, once good, you get good. once you get space racist on it. your ship like I'm, I'm picking all the paragon options but like this is like it's planning like those early seeds of like flirting and romance but every time you pick like a paragon option with her the game just just smash cuts to her face just going from like this to <laughs> oh dear god you're right <laughs> I wasn't looking at the camera, so I didn't see whatever Jose just did. <laughs> it, it, it's so obvious what they're doing. I'm just like, and it happens like three times in the same discussion. I'm just like, oh no. At least, no at least with Caden, he gets like adorably awkward when it's like, do you do this to all your servicemen, Shepard? And I'm like, only you. And he goes, I, uh, I need time to process this. And I'm just like, no time. <laughs> but, oh um, but, but for the point I wanted to go into, um, I, I meant to do a freaking video essay on this fucking a million years ago. Um, it, it is very good for its time, but it, it definitely shows its flaws as, 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 um, as it ages. I do not like the morality system of uh, Mass Effect, where if if you're trying to, I don't even want to say like min max. If, if you're trying to, um, get conversations and whatnot, like you have to be either Paragon or Renegade. There's like no middle ground. Yeah. So yep. so you you lose a lot of nuance of like how do I want to approach this situation? Maybe I need to be neutral. Maybe I need to be a bit more aggressive. Like it's just like no, that does not exist. You need to play Paragon. So this these are your dialogue choices. So they're effectively not choices and, and it's funny because in mass effect 3 they take out every single neutral option you cannot be neutral it's mm-hmm. just like one or the other and like they, they kind of drop the facade of it like you can't be neutral in mass effect 1 and 2 but you won't be getting the ability to do uh paragon and renegade actions that you would be otherwise so it's kind of also weird. what the first mass effect does that i've noticed i recently did this in a quest actually is the shortcut through quests are hidden between paragon and renegade choices so you can't be neutral if if you want to like find like quick easy ways to get through some missions like i just did a quest last night i'll be really vague on it where it was there was this whole other side quest that was actually related to it that um, you would have never guessed was related to it, but it was just a random dialogue option that you could pick, and the guy was like, oh, if you bring me that, that's illegal, bring it to me, and we'll do the right, we'll, like, follow the right paper paperwork and stuff. And seeing as I'm par- Paragon, I went, that's illegal. So I brought it to him, and he was like, oh, you need access to this one place story-wise, right? Here's really easy access as, as a thank you for doing this. And I was like, so if I hadn't have done this, I would have had to get there the hard way instead of just being given what I needed for doing this other side quest that was completely optional and not re- related to this. So it's like, and plus the the Paragon option was giving it to him. So it, it's like, I would have never guessed that those two things were 
related unless I had picked like a a neutral dialogue option where he said, "Oh, this this character asked you to do this. That's legal. Bring that to me. That's not supposed to happen." Like it was completely out of out of the way. If I had just been speeding through the like di- dialogue choices, I would have never figured that out and had to get to this area the hard way. So it it's it's so hidden behind stuff that it's like like I get people want to speed through this to like get to get to Mass Effect Two, but it's kind of hard to speed through it if you need to do side quests to actually. Like... I can't even I can't even begin to tell you like. Ah uh, shit! I forgot. I did a tweet freaking forever ago, but so I love the Mass Effect series. I like Mass Effect One. I fucking love Mass Effect Two, and so like I I've, I've played this series like to fucking death. I've played I've. And by say played, I mean like finish like full playthroughs. I've played Mass Effect one eight times. I've done Mass Effect two like twenty two times, and then three I've done like seventeen times. I I have played these games to fucking death, and I am still very tempted to just skip on right on over to two. But um, I guess maybe even just put a cap on it. Um, if you, if you want to lead out the last thoughts on it, uh, Blaine, any general thoughts on Mass Effect or even specifically the um legendary collection how come they gave liara like an elastic jumpsuit to make her titties look twice as big as they are <laughs> that's the only thing i have to say about anything we, we were talking about it uh, i don't remember where we were talking about it, but but do you remember when uh the fucking typical um anti-censorship crowd came out when like they, they took away like some of the miranda ass shots they're like you're yeah. ruining like the original game's vision and then they give fucking liara bigger titties and then they're just like completely silent because obviously they're fucking hypocrites exactly it's they know who they're dumb. pandering to <laughs> oh yes they do and i'll just leave it at that yep um shit i'm sorry did you have any other thoughts Blaine? No, like I said in chat, I've literally just been sitting here playing Monopoly since we started talking about it. Capitalist pig. I can't believe you. It's a simulator, and it's not good. But for some reason, <laughs> I still like it. Um, I don't think anyone... Has anyone here played Pokemon Snap? I know Corey has, but he's not here. At least verbally. I, I've tried to play it, but my kids and my partner... Uh keep preventing me from doing that. Do, do they not keep, like Pokemon? No, they keep stealing it away from me. <laughs> well, it uh, looks I, fun. <laughs> yeah, I played the original. Can't wait to uh, jump into the new one, but my backlog's already fucked up, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so the plan for next week is to do the uh, Resident Evil Village spoiler cast. Um, that will probably just be like the entire duration of next week's episode. We're talking um, about Resident Evil. <laughs> okay, but here's a decision we have to make. Um, so we are going to do like full story discussions. Do we want to lightly talk specifically and only on the gameplay stuff right here? In general I mean, impressions. Very hard, but sure. Even I semi believe. Even that can be kind of difficult, though. We have to be yeah. like super. I I will I'll I'll do this. Uh, I will lead the charge, and we feel I I trust your judgment to 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 uh, play it by ear. Um, Resident Evil is my favorite gaming franchise of all time. I made a stupidly fucking long video essay on Resident Evil Four. Um, so I I would have to like type out my listings or whatever, but like Resident Evil Four is my favorite fucking video game of all time, and village takes a lot of cues from four and a many many different aspects uh, and it is my second favorite resident evil game and that's pretty fucking high praise for me um since i hold that series like in very very high regard um one part that i think I, i've seen like maybe some people talk about it, but it's generally something people don't talk about within the games industry or like maybe even casual fans of like film and movies, uh, TV shows, whatever the pacing for this game is so fucking on point. And whether it's like the very purposeful setup where it says like, here is your a to B to C to, to D goals. Like you, you, you know, everything and just it's constantly adding variety in between things, giving you new, um, 
maybe not entirely new verbs, but the pacing's on point. That that's all I'll say. Um, without going into like story stuff or whatever, it's a uh, it's a good build a bear simulator, Blaine. No, you piece of shit. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh god, that's not that long. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. there's not there's not much I can say in this restricted fashion <laughs> that Jose hasn't said. The pacing is perfect. The tone, both tonal pacing, gameplay pacing narrative pacing um i know there are this is going to come dangerously close to what we're not trying to do but i know there's people that have issues with in some ways the back half of the game there's some people that have issues with the very very like last few bits of the of the game i i don't know this this might be this might actually become my favorite resident evil i'm not sure because it's just so many things that i wanted um and I also just want to, I just want to point out for like the millionth time that I predicted this game and what it was going to be like a year and a half or two years ago. Y'all saw me do it. Y'all mocked me when I fucking made my whole like, oh, this is, this is like a, sp- this is basically a remake of Resident Evil 4. And then now I didn't I, like, mock you. You didn't mock me. I'm talking about the general y'all, <laughs> including Twitter. <laughs> um, But no, like in all, but all jokes aside, no, I mean, it's. It's cool to get something that is so many things that I wanted just in a package. Um, and I can't really think of... I I definitely get the same feeling from this that I got from Resident Evil 4, which is like as soon as I beat it, I was like, okay, let's jump right back in. Let's, mm-hmm. let's, let's just keep going. Without spoilers, there's a new game... You can do new game plus on, on the harder difficulties... And I don't know why people are recommending like first playthrough play on hardcore because that shit's still pretty hard, even with like my, uh, I guess like the third tier weapons I don't have fully upgraded, but it, it's still a decent challenge. The reason um, why people were saying that was because people compared, people said that the casual mode in, in Village was way too easy and that even normal was on par with Resident Evil 7's casual. Hard is apparently on par with Resident Evil 7's normal. I never played Resident Evil 7 on normal because I'm a because I'm a bitch. So I was just like, I, th- I was I th- like, I was. I think like, those people don't. Mm-hmm. I think those people misunderstand that they're better at games than maybe they think they are, and that mm-hmm. that like, oh, this thing is too easy. Like, I don't think it's too easy. I think it is under your skill level, which is what it's there for. for I don't think it's even your skill level. I don't think it's even necessarily that. And like, uh, this is a point I was gonna bring up was um. There's been a bit of weird reception from people that have specifically like only played seven where they're more used to this. Um, I guess you can even tie it into like some of the older games where their their preconception of Resident Evil is every single enemy should be this big surmountable challenge, whereas Village is taking those heavy cues from four where it's just like, yeah, no, you have plenty of ammo to take out these dudes. Maybe you'll get a little tight here and there, but uh, like a single enemy in village is not as tough as a single mold enemy from seven that that's what i'll say yeah so, I, so maybe like the, that's where some of the the thought process comes from maybe yeah i yeah I, i'm not gonna spoil it but i think the last half of the game definitely is like if, if they had gone by the whole every enemy should be a challenge i would have gotten so fucking annoyed so bad mm-hmm um, they, like, oh, they do a good job of balancing the enemy density with tension. I'll I'll just say that. Oh, yeah. oh mm-hmm. I just I just want to say because this is a complete non-spoiler. Sarah, I was right. I <laughs> I was there. I was right about Werewolf Chris from the very beginning. Okay, but Capcom was gaslighting me the entire fucking time. I and believe I'm my words were this. that poster is marketing purposes. I am angry, but I'm angry in a horny on main way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that not the best way to be angry? I mean, I guess. I don't is know. <laughs> I mean, well, like, because, like, because, like, Blade and I discussed this, and I feel like Capcom just gaslighted people kind of a little bit, right? Right, Blaine? We discussed this. Yeah, like, I wouldn't say gaslighting like, necessarily, but th- there was like a bait and switch situation. Yeah, there was on. a total bait and bait and switch thing where like if and I'll talk about this on the on the podcast. If you think about it thematically, it makes sense. 
like everything and again i have a whole thing i'll discuss on spoiler cast about it um but if you look at it from like an outside standpoint you're like yeah i see that happening and then the thing doesn't happen and you're like you missed the opportunity (laughs) you missed an opportunity to do a thing I, just didn't I, do the thing. I, I will say with non-spoilers because this is a discussion that we had on I think like two episodes prior um, with, with with the premise of Chris doing the bad thing to to uh, to Mia. Um, shit, how do I want to say this? I think that marketing was very obvious and people thinking that Chris had turned completely evil. Um, that w- shit. How it was? It was not it. That's all I'll say. Marketing. <laughs> yep. Um, it was all good marketing, so that you can uh, also. You gotta love more. <laughs> you gotta love how that marketing for the game pivoted so fucking fast as soon as they saw people were, were horny for fucking uh, oh, yeah. Lady D- uh, Demetrisk. But then it wasn't just Lady Demetrusque, though, from the internet standpoint. <laughs> everyone's like, Lady Demetrusque, and then people beat the game two days later. Heisenberg? Like, everyone's just like, <laughs> everyone's like, oh god, there's two? Like, it's, I, and, uh, Canty, Canty Unplugged, which, oh, hey, we actually share the same opinion. I got you. Uh, it's like Capcom's new edition, new strategy, exploiting <laughs> bad. Bad. I'm so nervous that was gonna happen. Um, Capcom, uh, Capcom's new strategy exploiting gamers' horniness. Let's just be honest here. That isn't wrong. Like you have Chris, you have a Lady Demetrusk, you have Heisen Heisenberg. There's some weird people attracted to Ethan. I don't know. You 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 don't even see his face. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Ethan can't groom anyone in Village, so it's okay. I mean, he can't, but he also doesn't have a face. <laughs> and if people are just being attracted to, he's a tough dad. It's like, yeah, okay, that's fine. But like, no, I'm I'm Team Chris all the way. Once he started punching <laughs> boulders, that was all in. So that boulder punching asshole. I'm staring at my very nice Chris Redfield statue I got from the collector's edition. Which let me say, it, the collector's edition, if you buy it on next gen consoles, was like two hundred and ten dollars because I think it's because you were paying for the like next gen version of the game. That Chris statue is very nice. Like it is very detailed. It's just, it's put together really, really nicely compared to to the Jill and Chris one that they released for the two remake and the three remake. Chris is fucking thick. Like he's a very big. Like he's a very big boy. Hell yeah. Like it's it's just it's just it's so nice. Like it's and like I. I'm I'm gonna go way more into how how much I absolutely adored this game when we do the spoiler cast, but like when I played Village, the amount of times that I said, "Man, it's great to be playing a Resident Evil game again," was just like so astronomical because it just kept happening. I would just out loud be like, "My God, it's so great to play a Resident Evil game again," because it, I- it's just Resident Evil is just so good, and Village is incredibly high up there as one of my favorite resident evil games of all time i don't exactly have a list because i love all of them very equally except for six you know what you did it's it it's like i'm and just the recent re remakes and seven and this like resident evil's on a fucking high like and they're just gonna keep i have this feeling that like this high is it going to stop <laughs> yeah I, I think people underestimate like how many or how much good resident evil shit has happened in years like there was seven in 2017 there was uh the two remake in 2019 uh 2020 had the three remake and now it's village like we are getting freaking uh resident evil like on a almost like yearly basis and i, I know the four remakes not going to be done by next year they we had a story where um it's getting delayed because of production stuff and whatnot but there has been a lot of good resident evil shit in a very short span of time yeah, and it's like I completely like, and especially going back in like the Resident Evil Three remake, I get why people don't like that game. I personally loved it and adored it for like a multitude of different reasons, gameplay not just being one of them. But like, you have to admire a series that's both sticking to its roots with games like the two and three 
re remake and bringing itself into the future with seven and eight. Like they're doing literally the best of both. Mm-hmm. And just casually, like they're just like putting these out, and there's like, and again, like like Blaine said, like you said, Village is becoming people's favorite Resident Evil game of all time in a series that's stacked to the brim with really fucking great titles. I I and think for me, it all, I think for me, it also just stood out more because, um, like I liked Resident Evil Seven, like I I didn't love it as much as just like oh this is one of the best Resident Evil games of all time. I thought it was like a good return to form while bring while breathing some new um, uh, fresh air into the series, but like Village just like took my already like crazy high uh expectations and just like fucking blew them out of the water. So I am oh, totally. And it launched the night of my birthday, and it was pretty fucking cool. Like, I I can't begin to verbally explain how much Village blew my expectations. Like, just exploded them. Like, it was, honest to God, I didn't think it would, like, I thought, I thought it'd be good, because let's be honest, it's a newer generation Resident Evil game, and those are just really good. But, like, it would do little things. It would, like harker back to older titles in ways that literally just blew my fucking mind like i was like i can't believe that this is as good as it fucking is like we don't deserve this Mm -hmm. (laughs) gamers don't deserve resident evil village because it's so goddamn good like every inch of it every ounce of it i mean obviously i have my little like nitpicks which this this is a spoiler but i'm just gonna bring this up really really fast in the ps5 version the game has haptic feedback and haptic triggers whoever programmed it does this really annoying very loud clicking noise whenever you switch guns to like so like if you're switching from a shotgun to a pistol the the haptic feedback gets less because obviously pistols are easier to fire than like shot uh shotguns are but when you do it it makes this incredibly loud clicking noise and blaine can attest to this because i literally sent a video to her of the clicking noise when it's like other games have done this like Rainbow Six is a big example of mine. Other games have done this and make no sounds out of the controller. <laughs> so I don't know like what they were doing, but like what it's it got so annoying after a while, and I just ended up having to force myself to like tune it out because by the end of the game I was switching back and forth between guns really fast. So I would just hear like click 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 like in the controller. And at first people were like, oh, it sounds like it's like it's the like speaker in the controller no <laughs> for, for what it's worth Corey was telling me uh, e- even when he was playing the demo and i guess he's bringing it back up here in the comments um he really liked all the haptic feedback and even the uh to, to quote oh, no. him specifically he 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 i like the clicky clack sounds well like i like haptic feedback in in games especially in resident evil of village when stuff can get really tense and you're having to like just like hit it in the right way just to keep getting like shotgun fires out but like if games before you have done the same thing and, and have done it quietly and done it well, what what happened? Like, this is easily something they can fix with, like, an in-game patch, to be completely honest. I believe you can but, also do it manually at a system level. Yeah, it's just, like, why have it... Like, m- my thinking is it was just a last-minute thing that they just didn't have time to fix, and they said, well, if this is the only thing that's really game-breaking, game-breaking, just throw it out, it's fine. But, like, that clicking noise, depending on how close you hold your controller to your face, because I sometimes do when I'm, like, scared, that shit can, 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 like, get annoying and, like, break immersion, kind of, because all because all you hear is click, 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 click. It's like, come on. I mean, I'm <laughs> playing on PC, so all I hear is click, 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 click. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I'm well, so like, glad you brought just... that up, because it scared the hell out of me when it first started happening. So I, I was shaking my controller around. It's like, is something broken inside? Yeah. <laughs> and then I switch weapons and click. I'm like, damn it. Okay. Yeah, like it's again. The <laughs> the only reason why I'm nitpicky on this is I have played other games that have done this and they do it well. There's no noise in the controller, so I'm just like, what happened? Like, <laughs> I'm like, right. what, what, what happened? Like, what, what easily could have been fixed that they just like let go? <laughs> just um, weird. I guess to close out, um, Ramen and Blaine, do you have any additional thoughts before we move on? Loving if, the game so far. Oh, go ahead, boy. If you got through Resident Evil 7, really enjoying it, but feeling like, I wish that could just have a little bit more polish, a little bit more fine-tuning, and to be able to really, really figure out what it wants to do and be consistent, then you'll be very happy with Resident Evil 8. 
yeah, looking back on it now, I, I feel like seven was almost a tech demo for what they could do in first person and them exploring the medium, so to speak. And eight is them realizing it. So it's a great game, really fun. I will say, though, seven still has probably the best boss fight in video game history, which is a motel, a reference to a B movie made in the 80s or 70s, I forget which, called Motel Hell where two people fight with chainsaws. So until another game does something like that, I don't know if I'll be able to say it's as good. They have, there's ever a boss fight as good as that boss fight. Also friendly, friendly reminder that the engine that we all thought was called the Resident Evil engine is called the reach for the moon engine. Wait, is that, is that the actual thing? Yes. Oh my God. It's not Ooh, called the RE engine. It's not, it's not like the Resident Evil engine like we all thought it was. It's, it's gone forbid the reach for the moon engine, which made it's me fine. so unnaturally angry when I heard I'm that. I'm going to reach back into the that. past to make them change their mind. That's what I'm going to do. It's oh, Capcom. Fine. It's so dumb. <laughs> Capcom got a Capcom. It. Thank you. That's like the best description I've ever heard. It's just Capcom got a Capcom. Like. <laughs> Jeez. Let's see where time code. We are at one, two. Um, one little thing I guess we can do with, without going into many details. If you, if everyone just wants to list like maybe three games on top of their backlog. Oh. So for me, Yakuza oh. Seven. I'm getting apparently very close to the end. <laughs> After that, I am doing. Shit, it was going to be Returnal. I'm going to do Near and then Returnal. Uh, I haven't touched those two at all whatsoever. Uh, uh, Sarah? Uh, Ghost of Tsushima. I got like three hours into it. I really want to finish that game and I want to see Jin's butt. Um, it's a long game. What? You're, you'll see Jin's butt many times. Um. Oh, fuck. Oh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I have not touched Valhalla oh, yet. That is I like want a... to really bad. Um, that was I like a hundred hours. I just miss an Assassin's Creed game. Um, and looking at my shelf, even though it's kind of dark, so I can't exactly see my whole shelf. Um, also, Demon Souls. I should probably beat that at some point, <laughs> or else people just keep asking me to be on charity stream so I can beat it. <laughs> Give me an incentive to actually beat that game <laughs> and not be and not fall down the same goddamn hole twelve times. <laughs> oh, Sarah. Uh, Blaine, you want to go? <laughs> yeah, um, because I literally was just like, let me pick up the stack of PS4 cases that I have sitting on top of my Xbox right now. Um, <laughs> I where to begin? Um, I I too need to still be Yakuza Seven. Um, you're actually gonna surpass me soon, which is funny. Um, I need to. Believe it or not, I need to fucking be Doom Eternal. I got like 80% of the way through that game and had to put it down and just kept not having it. I just kept forgetting to go back to it, and I'm probably just going to start it from the beginning. But like, it retains progress, so I'll have all my power-ups and whatnot. Are you planning Um, on playing the DLC? Eventually. Uh, It's not a big priority for me. Um, And I, I started Resident Evil Revelations 2 yet again, beat episode one yet again and have not continued it so i need to actually beat that um and recently square enix even though i keep talking about how many things they do that make me mad have once again gotten me to spend money i have i have re-upped my subscription to final fantasy 14 i have because i wanted to get the lunar whale mount um Mm -hmm. Can the Dance RU engine your... reach the lunar whale? Oh, I have the lunar whale. I have it. It's it's in my inventory, and I've been flying around with it. <laughs> um, but that being said, oh, fuck you. Um, that that was a complicated one. I I gave you props for that one, Jose. Um, <laughs> but no, no, no. Um, I I'm now I finished the second expansion, so I need to finish the third and fourth before the final one comes out. Um, I have Britain Walker pre-ordered already. I'm pretty sure I did a PayPal paying for one. If I didn't, then I'll find out soon enough when I get yelled at. Um, but yeah, um, I I can't really think of anything else that's like I would consider part of my backlog. Keep my shelf. Uh, 
Oh, Sleeping Dogs. That's a game I started and never went back to that I do need to finish. Pretty good. Uh, I, actually cl- oh. I actually cleared off Final Fantasy X recently, so I was happy about that. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Hey, don't make fun of that scene out of context. <laughs> uh, Ramen, what's on your backlog? Yeah, so first off is Near Replicant. Um, bought it. I'm afraid to open it and feel the feels. Once don't I start be playing. afraid. I know, I, I just need to I embrace it. Camera, don't be afraid. <laughs> embrace it. Embrace the Embrace sadness. it, Ramen. Yep, I can feel Yoko Taro crying for me. Um, then Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I'm maybe 20 hours in, and it sounds like I'm 80 hours out. God. <laughs> it's such an intimidatingly <laughs> long game. And then one of my more obscure ones is Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth. I'm actually, <gasps> Hell yeah! yeah. Cyber, Cyber Sleuth rocks! Though, the one thing I will say about that game, though, is that there's a difficulty spike near the end that's so unfair. <laughs> So oh, just grind. God. I know okay. I just made a grind, to- <laughs> but like this is just someone who literally almost gave up. Like it's not fair. That's like the only like really annoying part of that game is the spike literally is like zero to ten, and it's just like whoa. <laughs> that is good to know. But yeah, it, but that game's getting, so good. I, I like I like that game. I like so dark much Digimon stories. Yeah, it's so weird, and it, it it's got its head up its own ass, but in a fun way, and. It's charming. It's it's Pokemon light. <laughs> yeah, kind know, of. Yep. I know the Digimon creators are probably throwing up by by doing that, but <laughs> yeah, it's it's good times. So those are my my big three right now. Nice. Um, let's go ahead and move on over to some news. There hasn't really been too much sprouting up over the last three weeks, but uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, 2016's critically acclaimed Titanfall 2 faced financial and player base woes upon launch due to a myriad of factors that can pretty much basically just be blamed from EA sandwiching it, its release in between Battlefield 1 and I believe it was uh, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. Uh, so kind of eating their own lunch with that. Um, let's see. Uh, but players showed up in mass over the over some recent weekends, um, and there's even a free weekend for Titanfall 2 on Steam. Um, and I, there's some more people coming in to play Titanfall 2 because I guess there's some tie-in stuff going on with Apex Legends, which is a character so from the recent Apex Legends character has really intense ties to a uh, Titanfall. Like I think it's yeah, the most intense ties that she, any character has. She's had. the daughter of one of the dudes you kill. And now every time I, I I kill that dude, I will be slightly sad, but I'll also be have a smile on my face because that game's very fun to play. So it's okay. Um, um, in total, the peak amount of players within Titanfall Two eclipsed its former achievement of uh, thirteen hundred six hundred and three, and jumped over to sixteen hundred and nine uh, nine hundred seventy four. So for a game that came out back in twenty sixteen, for just like kind of like not randomly, but to jump back up and break that peak um five years later um especially since uh, especially even on pc for the most part it's been pretty dead you might get like maybe 100 200 people max but it, w- it was just a good excuse for me to like jump back in a titanfall and just be like yeah this game plays fucking amazing and it's a damn shame that it didn't get the um the love, the adoration, and even just like the player base that it deserved. And I, I will die on this pedestal. It has the best first person, not even first person, it has the best grappling hook in a video game period, and you can't even use it in the yes. campaign. It, it's it's multiplayer exclusive, but if they were to make like a first person Spider-Man game, I would want it control like this. I mean, especially with PC where, you know, you can just snap up and see like the corner of a building and just snap it up there and like use the actual momentum <laughs> It's not like Dying Light where you just like toss the grappling hook and he magically tosses you towards that specific point. Uh, you can use the momentum in the parkour to um, to land on buildings. You can you can hide out on this one specific map that's like in the middle of a desert. And so like the city's technically underground. You can just hang out on the top just by using the grappling hook. And it's really fucking cool. Um, uh Jose, uh, for president 2024, I'll uh, legally mandate grappling hooks in games. Every game should have them. Got my vote. 
That's an easy vote for me. Any uh, general Titanfall thoughts from the crew? Uh, I like a boy and his robot. (laughs) (laughs) All I remember. I'm sorry. I don't know if I'm still slightly, like, buzzed or something, but, like, all my mind could think of when you were talking about Titanfall is just a boy and his robot. Because that's all that uh, that's all I remember from that game. I remember killing other robots and people, but then I just remember the dialogue options with BT. And if you were mean to BT, then I was mean to you. <laughs> I don't think you can really be super mean, but you well, know, like, I you could not answer him, and I consider that mean. That robot's yeah. talking to you. That robot's your friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah, I don't. Him. I I will forgive you for being buzzed as long as you don't take uh, light years to respond. Nothing. No, I was waiting to take light years to respond. <laughs> <laughs> that is the uh, correct response. Yeah. Um, I almost so well no, actually do, you, and then I was like, "It's not even worth it." <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Kind it's okay. Of somewhat. Um, You're not sorry. I I think it would be very cool if they made some kind of single player Apex Legends campaign where. You're doing like some kind of parkour and like maybe there's like some robots that fall from the sky or something but they can just make another titan ball <laughs> i mean yeah that's please. what i was a- that, that's what i was aiming at <laughs> please like at least just make like uh, they made break from apex like just use that sweet sweet making barrage's hair better money and give us a titan full tree mm-hmm. i don't even play apex and i have a mirage pop like come on I've heard Titanfall is a very fun game. I have only really I played the demo for two. I think back when there was like a beta on PS4 right before the game came out. Um, and I think I even I don't know if it was ever if it was on PS Plus, then I have it. Otherwise, I know it's on Game Pass. And when I get back again, I'll, it'll be on there. It's one of those like forever on my backlog because I don't play a lot of first person shooters these days. But I know that that's supposed to be a really, really fun one. And I've yeah. been like wanting to play a an actually fun <laughs> first person shooter that isn't also just like an arena shooter. Yeah, I I know for like um, Corey and Mesa aren't particularly big on first person shooters, and so like when it comes to like recommending a game, I'm not going to recommend like some like generic off the mill uh, B tier like shooter, but like. If I, if I had to pick these shooters from like this gen, it would be like Titanfall 2 and Doom. I'd say like, look, even if you're not necessarily big on this genre, you're probably going to have a pretty damn good time with this. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just a testament to their uh, overall quality. Also has one of the best levels in, uh, in a video game this generation period. I guess um, I don't want to say Dishonored 2 ate its lunch, but they do a very similar thing and they're both pretty fucking cool. Maybe, I'm maybe. trying to, uh, so this is kind of kind of off topic, but I mentioned it in the chat. I'm trying to find it. Ah, I found it. Um, when the first Titanfall was released or was revealed at the Game Awards fucking forever ago, there was like this ARG they had going on where you called this number and it would give you like lore stuff about the game because it was like the company that makes the Titans and stuff. Well, I still have the number on my phone. I was gonna... Call it. Oh, I was Call going it. to. I was going to see if it actually. You got to make sure it's on speaker. It is on speaker. I don't know if you can. I can. I cannot hear a ring. Whoa, that's not it. <laughs> oh, you call? Did you... Oh, no. It may or may not have led to a sex hotline. Okay. I don't... okay. Fun, fun fact uh, about uh, abort mission. Fun fact about that. Nah. Um, typically, call when com- it again. When, when no! the- <laughs> typically, when, when companies uh, do stuff like that, they do, they buy a phone number. The only the contract for it only lasts a few years, and then it just goes back onto the market. And uh, surprise, surprise, there's a specific market that um, that buys a lot of phone numbers. That's true. I was not aware of that, but like when you called it. It was like sort of like when you're calling like a like a company and it was like, oh, enter the <laughs> enter the like number of the party that you're trying to reach for like Hammond Robotics. 
which was obviously the company that made the like Titans. And if you dug around the the website for the first Titan Titanfall, you would find numbers to put in there, and you would like be calling certain like research team members, and it would give you lore for the for the first Titanfall. So like so like the backdrop of the of, of the game where where it's like an army versus a rebellion. And it would just give you, like, little lore snippets that was incredibly cool. And, like, the and people were, like, discovering numbers and, like, different, uh, different, like, people in the game to, to, like, call and give you, like... Because, like, the first Titanfall had lore in it, it just was hidden because it was all multiplayer stuff. So, like, the fact that they did something like that was incredibly cool. I think it's crazy they even put in that effort because as much as I like the the writing between Cooper and uh, BT and Titanfall 2 story, I don't think that universe or world is necessarily I don't want to say it's bad. It, it it's it's good. It like it's good for what it is. But like so much of that appeal of that game is like <laughs> so purely on on the gameplay uh for with a parkour and uh, just the speed of it because nothing else on the market's really doing that i guess you can say like infinite warfare was trying to go for that same thing but it's yeah um to move on to the next story um let me write this down uh sony has announced a partnership with discord with plans to bring the text and voice service to playstation platforms beginning sometime next year uh, Discord has previously been rumored to go public in addition to looking for buyers, which included Sony's direct competitor, Microsoft. Uh, overall, having a unified communications app between all the gaming platforms is ultimately a net benefit for gamers. Uh, but uh, why the fuck did I write this sentence this way? Jesus Christ. Okay, anecdotally for me, I think this is fucking amazing. I want Discord to be on every gaming platform available. Uh, so here's an anecdote me and sarah we used to play siege on uh on console i typically played on pc but i'll play with people on other platforms um i like to play most games with headphones especially a game like siege where you need to be able to hear where people are walking like oh are they up on the second floor above me or but what direction are they in it, it's very nice to play with headphones um so i have two options when i'm playing um a game on console if I want to chat with them, we need to use PSN service, which means uh, everyone has to agree to jump all over to PlayStation. We use that. That way you can still use my headphones. Uh, second option, everyone hops in a Discord because it's a nice, convenient thing that normal human beings like to do nowadays. Uh, but then I can't have my headset on, so I'm at a disadvantage when I'm playing. Um, it, Yeah, it, it's it's not fun. But... I, th- I think overall having a unified experience is is ultimately that net benefit to everybody. And um, maybe this is even like specifically a PC issue because, you know, you log in onto uh, on a PlayStation or Xbox. You can see everything your friends are playing. If they're playing Call of Duty, they're playing Halo, whatever. It doesn't really matter uh, on PC. I would like to think the old golden rule was. Regardless if you're playing something on Blizzard, if you're playing League or Ubisoft Origin, like the general rule of thumb is you log into Steam. That's where you see like all your friends are online. And obviously Discord has kind of taken that and just be like, hey, by default, log in, log into Discord. Everyone knows who what friends are online doing what and whatnot. So I think even expanding that further is uh, a pretty damn good convenience. But uh, anyone else have any impassioned uh discord discourse so my favorite thing about discord is the fact that your friends can see what you're what you're playing i don't know why i like that that's just a weird thing to me so be so your friends being able to see what you're playing on like playstation i think is really cool because it's like oh you can actually see that i am on my playstation why would you think that i am lying to you like i am currently on it i am playing something but also like i use discord a lot it's how me and my boyfriend connect is we talk through that because it's because it's because it's just easier so it's like being able to use something with playstation because like playstation parties are great um i use them a lot because that's how me and my friend play each together that's how you and i play each together but i but i like to it's it's the whole thing of being able to have my headphones in uh hearing everything in 
stage while also hearing my friend and not being able to get like distracted or anything. I mean, I'm personally fine with PlayStation parties. I like Discord parties, but it's all based on like what's what's good in the moment, if that makes sense. Like, mm-hmm. do I want to be on a Discord party so I can hear my game and talk to someone at at the same time? Or do I want to be on a PlayStation party because I want to hear the game and hear someone say, hey, to your left, or here, there's something behind you. So I can know in-game, like, oh, there's actually just something behind me, or there there's a noise to my left that I didn't hear. Right. Type of thing. So. Blaine, Ramen, any thoughts? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree that it's situational for me. I think I'm the old man who shakes fist at cloud meme with Discord. <laughs> 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 to where I, I understand its appeal and and the fact that it's a unified chat program, you know, across any platform that you're on. But sometimes the convenience of just staying within the boundaries of the walled garden, you know, of PlayStation or Xbox is, is more convenient, kind of like to what Sarah was alluding to. But, I, you know, the more open that the PlayStation gets, the better. Hopefully they're tearing a couple of those walls down. I know that it was a big ask for them to do crossplay, apparently, from, you know, said lawsuit <laughs> coming out. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think it can only help. The more, you know, unified chat programs we have, the better, more united people will get. Yeah. Yep. I pretty much agree. Um, the more... Uh, I think I think Discord has its issues that can and need to be ironed out over time. But aside from you know just whatever thing I could think of, uh, the fact that it's avail going to be either is or going to be available on more platforms is great. Being able to like, like for instance, like if you want to play, if they figure out a way to, I don't know if there's a way to do cross play on like Mario Combat 11, for example, with friends. I know there's a way to do it like matchmaking, basically a randos. So, like, if you could figure out, like, you know, things, situations like that and have you be able to talk to your friends at the same time, not have to log into their computer to do it, not have to be on the same system to do it. Just more options for people and it's going to bring people together. I, th- I think uh, just just a quick example and then we can move on. Like, uh, l- let's take uh, Fortnite where you can play it like on everything under the sun. Uh, like, you can see if your Fortnite friends are playing on other platforms, like, if you're actively playing that game, but being able to see what everyone's doing, like, at any given time, you know, obviously, if they're, if they have those connections available, um, and being able to circumvent using game chat because in game chat fucking sucks. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, for Fortnite, nine it- times out of ten. <laughs> yep. Especially in, like, if you're playing, like, a Call of Duty or Siege. Oh yeah. You do not want to deal with that shit. You don't. Um I guess Roman alluded to it, so let's go to the next story. So I didn't really bother writing like a big set of like coherent notes uh for, <laughs> for this because it's such a fucking mess in of itself. Um so yeah, let's talk about the Apple v Epic or Epic v Apple, whatever it however it's posited. <laughs> Um, so just for a quick little recap, Epic broke uh, terms of service with Apple by allowing Fortnite players to purchase microtransactions directly from their website instead of through the uh, in-game app. So that circumvented Apple's policy. Uh, Apple took down Fortnite from the App Store and uh, Epic struck back with a pre-planned like ad campaign to be like, what was the hashtag? Free Fortnite? Like it was ready like the day that happened. They didn't pull that out of their ass like last second they like it was it was ready um and so epic has taken apple to courts uh with the ulterior motive uh well stated ulterior motive of uh toppling apple's monopoly and industry restrictive practices such as the uh the 3070 cuts um so yeah instead of what we're going to do here is we're going to take some random little tidbits and kind of laugh at them (laughs) Uh, so, so, so Can I just the... point out something really, really fast? And I don't yeah, know if this is it. on your list, but I was going to say it anyway. Apple's lawyer literally looked Epic in the eye and was like, you are aware that your top 20 games actually has 25 games on it. <laughs> <laughs> and Epic, honest to God, was like, yes. So <laughs> They're like, you are aware that you're lying to your customers about your top 20 That's having so 25 dumb. games on it. And I'm just Pettiest like... Of petty bullshit. 
Also that Apple's lawyers had to say the words of Warframe and Necromonger in the same sentence. Oh <laughs> and they're like, God. what's a Warframe? There's even so much stupid lawyer shit going on where they're, they're talking about like the skins in Fortnite and they're just like, and they're talking about, I guess there's a skin in Fortnite called like Mr. Peely, who's a Peely, banana. Oh my God, and, the and, and, banana. They have, and they have yep, to bring up just like. That's the thing I can even comment on. And they, and they have to <laughs> mention know, like the banana isn't wearing underwear and the, and they're just like, God. does it show anything? And they're and the, and the epic lore is like, no, it's a banana. It doesn't have a penis. Can't. Chat it's just a banana. A <laughs> icon, don't forget. Peely's <laughs> like my like my sleep paralysis demon. Like Peely's in the corner of my room, just staring at me with unblinking eyes as I can't as I can't move in the middle of the night. Like I hate Peely. I hate Peely with a deep rooted passion. He's just scary. I'm so glad that he exploded during that <laughs> during that cutscene. So much of the shit is just like legalese bullshit for. And like I'm just gonna quote uh, Rebecca Valentine of IGN. Uh, all in all, the United States court system wasn't prepared for the cocktail of a high-profile case centered around an industry that is secretive <laughs> to the point oh of God. absurdity. And uh, we we've talked about that before, just like in comparison, like I guess the closest uh, analog would be the film industry, which doesn't fucking care if anyone knows like what they're working on. Um. And just like so much even of the jargon like in front of a judge is just like what the fuck is all this bullshit it's so stupid oh but, yeah when, um, when, when you have a lawyer you know submitting into evidence <laughs> all these redacted files into a public dropbox right and then on top of that companies are issuing pullbacks on those redacted files <laughs> on a you know minute to minute basis during the actual trial it's it's just an utter shit show, but it is hilarious to watch. <laughs> also, uh, I, I don't know if this is also on, on your list, but the like leaked characters that are planned for Fortnite that they had to give over to like the judge for some reason. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That was like uh, Samus, uh, the the bride from Kill Kill Bill, John McClane from Die Hard, The Rock, really, The Rock. Yeah, literally, John McClane was on that list. Fortnite's but there was also crazy. like Kobe, Kobe, Kobe Bryant. Um, oh no, Lady Gaga, oh, <laughs> Ariana God. Grande. Like that was a trip. I read that list and I was like, "Whoa." <laughs> Samus, Samus sounds uh, cool though. Um, let's see. Uh, multiple business partners have chimed it. Or no, did I skip a part? No. Uh, multiple business partners have chimed in to refuse access to information and redact them with games such as uh, Saints Row 5 getting leaked in the process. So just like Epic has like so many countless business partners throughout the industry, like even Sony, Microsoft, third party companies, whatever. Everyone's dirty laundry is getting fucking tossed out for everybody to see because um, Apple wants to dig through all this shit and it's kind of crazy it, it's it's weird seeing like so much of what was a secret within the industry just getting like laid down on the table um there, there was a document that came out showing how much epic paid for um for exclusive games or even just like the free games they gave away like how much money they gave um to developers so i think like borderlands 3 got like it got like a uh, hundred million and some, some odd change to launch exclusively on on epic uh, some of the free games they they gave out, like indie games, um, some of them got pretty low balled with like 80k, while some others got like uh, millions. It's it's kind of crazy how big of a disparity there is, and I imagine that might have uh, ruffled a few feathers within the indie game uh, a dev community. Would just be like, well, how come your game literally got like 20 times what mine got? Um. See what else do we have in here? Uh, Ramen, you already brought up the public folder, which people downloaded because I don't know why they would put that up public. I have no idea. Oh, it was good times, man. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, it came out that Sony really hated the idea of cross platform and uh, required Epic to compensate them uh, financially from like uh, microtransactions that people would have uh, quote unquote otherwise bought. Uh, from playing on PlayStation, like they bought it via another platform or if they bought it from the website and whatnot. Um, 
And it also came out that this wasn't limited strictly to Epic, and Sony kind of extends this policy to other partners. Um, as part of that exchange, there's a couple of emails. And if, if, if feel free to jump in if anything in particular stands out. Um, Epic reached out to Microsoft to open up Xbox Live to free multiplayer just weeks prior to the uh, battle with Fortnite. Um, there's actually a pretty funny casual email between uh, Tim Sweeney, the CEO of uh, Epic, and mm -hmm. uh, Phil Spencer, the CEO of uh, Microsoft, where Tim Sweeney's just going, just like, yeah, maybe you should do like this free-to-play thing. Um, anyway, enjoy the shit show that's going to happen next week. Um, <laughs> he, he says, enjoy the fireworks, the upcoming oh, fireworks, and he's talking hmm. about the pre-Fortnite thing. My God. Uh, the one thing that we failed to discuss was that like big ad campaign that Epic had against Apple was very clearly based off of one of the original um, Apple computer ads. That yeah, I think we did that with the. Um, yeah, I think we did that when Nitro was on. Like, damn, it was Nitro literally on? propaganda at children. <laughs> <laughs> like, bro, <bruh. laughs> like I don't. Yeah, like it, There's no way around that. I, it's just it's absolutely fucking. Like, just, so, I know nothing about, like, I mean, I watch the legal eagle on YouTube, but that's as much as I know about, like, lawyer stuff. And it's, like, just the, just the shit coming out of this. It's like when you're trying to explain video game stuff to your grandparents. And you, and they're like, so is there anything sexual about the banana? And it's like, no, he's a <laughs> banana. <laughs> like, like, it's just... I just can't believe that these are actually things being said in a court of law. Like, like two lawyers are be are literally talking over a sentient banana as if this is the most important thing in this lawsuit. Well, I, like, one of the most hilarious parts of it was when they asked apparently Tim Sweeney, "Hey, can can you put this switch together?" And he's like, "No, I can't. I don't know how to put this Joy-Con into oh switch." My God. That yeah, that was a literal thing that happened. That was my grandma. <laughs> oh, As I just mentioned, grandparents. I am a. Um, I am a. I am a. I am a. I don't know when I'm. At, but, but yeah, it's just like seeing this is some of the most greatest shit I've ever seen because I know it's bad. This whole thing is bad. But just the whole idea of just two lawyers talking about a sentient banana so seriously is just like it's it's every day I wake up and I remember that Peely's sexuality was discussed and I'm. <laughs> What, 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 like Boris. one of the biggest shit show aspects of this was um alongside the court system being unprepared for the scenario the uh, nature of it taking place online led to issues uh of the public call in line being abused with random callers screaming free Fortnite and uh playing travis scott music uh one person oh. called in to say we want mobile back i'm so poor i can't afford a console <laughs> And a oh. bunch of other <laughs> obscenities I will not oh admit God. here. <laughs> yeah, I, so I for fun I tried dialing into the Zoom and it was just unintelligible. And oh Jesus! Like, like yeah, nope, I'm not gonna do this again. <laughs> Such nope. a shit show. Yeah, it's really bad. Um, some in other interesting stats. Um, so so sh should be apparent that um reason why epic gives out free games and whatnot is to get people onto their platform to get them interested it's an investment um but according to internal uh, epic documents only seven percent of people who installed the epic game store for a free game have gone on to buy another game from the service um so you already talked about the data about people getting paid um epic in 2018 epic made 5.7 billion dollars 2019 4.2 and uh, 2020 5.1 with the 97% uh, of the revenue in 2018 coming from Fortnite. Like like Epic was already a very fucking well off company just being um the engine company and like it's been using like in, in games and movie sets and stuff but uh so so on top of all that money they already had, it's been fucking eclipsed where 97% of their 2018 revenue was fucking Fortnite. That's that's insane. I th I feel like people <sighs> like I I'm informed of the industry, but I think I feel like even I underestimated like how fucking ridiculous it is how much money that Epic makes uh, specifically from Fortnite. 
And they and were yet, really well off. Video the games are so expensive to make, and that's why we have to have microtransactions, and that's why we can't pay the developers <laughs> a living wage. Oh my god, it's almost like it's all a big stupid fucking game and it's all bullshit. I I concur. Blaine has a point. Sorry, yeah. that's like the only thing I've been able to contribute to this whole conversation, so I really felt I needed to say it. Blaine, what do you have to speak about an unnaked Peely? Uh, I, I do not wish to speak about naked to Peely. Here's all I have to say. Is he circumcised? There, but I'm Tish. But I'm Tish. Mm. Sorry, I hate that when I'm slightly drunk, I fixate He's... on a naked Peely. This is terrible. Well, it, it haunts your nightmares, right? <laughs> yes, it does. Um, I... I hate that skin with a passion, but some uh, other yeah. interesting tidbits. Um, and I, I kind of wish Mesa was here because he he would he's passionate about this part specifically. Um, Google Play offered uh, an eighty-eight to twelve cut for revenue share for Fortnite, but uh, Tim Sweeney said no unless uh, they gave that cut to everybody, so including everyone that makes games on the Google Play Store. Um, and and I feel like like even the the. I'm not going to play like, oh, I like this corporation better than this corporation because it's whatever. It's just in it, in it for money. But if the ultimate outcome out of Epic winning this is ultimately a better revenue share for smaller developers, I think that's a net benefit either way. Um, yeah, it, it is an interesting dichotomy because Epic is very much not the angel in this, right? They have their own machinations that they're going for. Like one speculation i saw was hey they really want more of a revenue cut because their store is not making money and it probably won't make money until 2024 so this is them kind of getting ahead of the ball and taking more control to help divorce themselves from fortnite and maybe get their store onto other devices but then you have apple where they're the giant corporation right <laughs> they are the giant corporation so the, nobody's well off in this case but i'm i'm with you on that jose and that Hey, if that's a side effect that developers get paid more and you know the platforms open up a little bit more to these struggling indie developers, which they are, then hell yeah, why not? Hell yeah. Um, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, boy. I just said hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I guess one last little tidbit I have here. Uh, when Tim Sweeney reached out to Tim Cook, the um, CEO of Apple, uh, he kind of just had a uh, just a letter saying like, hey, I think we should go to you as a company should move towards doing this 88 to 12 cut. It's better for developers, better for the industry and whatnot. Uh, Tim Cook's only response within an internal email, which they had to show in court, his only response to this was, uh, is this the guy that was at one of the rehearsals? Like he did not know who the fuck uh, Tim Sweeney was. He, he does not give a fuck about Tim Sweeney whatsoever. <laughs> it's it's just funny. That's incredible. Like yep. it was just some <laughs> random guy that was there. He's like some janitor or something. I, it's, it's dumb. Some random. Guy oh there. my god. Yep, that's the power disparity, right? <laughs> Doesn't yeah, seem like it, yeah. but in a nutshell. Yep, that's difference between hundreds of billions and tens of billions. <laughs> yep. Um, I think we got time for one more. Uh, this one should be kind of short. Go ahead and mark this. Da, da, da. Two. Okay. Uh, PlayStation CEO Jim Ryan revealed a wave of information in an interview with uh, Nick Kay, uh, including that the company has quietly, sorry, has quietly invested in producing more first-party titles and acquisition opportunities, uh, stating, uh, "We will make sure that the PS5 generation will have more dedicated software than ever before." Sorry, I, I am not used to my freaking uh, notes being on my second monitor. It's a little bit further away, so I strain. Uh, consumers' faith in Sony's Japanese-centric output was shaken when news broke months ago that Sony Japan Studio was shuttering its doors while reallocating staff to support Astrobot. Uh, but Jim Ryan remarks that PlayStation is committed to the Japanese market, saying it is important for us to provide software that fits the Japanese gaming community. And PlayStation 5 has included a lot of software from Japanese developers since its early stages. We will continue to strengthen our ties with Japanese developers and release content for PlayStation 5 that fits the Japanese market. Um, I, th I think um, 
this is a little bit important because there has been like a bunch of increasing worries that Sony's is putting all their eggs in one basket, like whether it's Naughty Dog or uh, Santa Monica and whatnot. And then just like kind of even that that general public perception that they are moving away from the Japanese markets. But it is, uh, I think, reassuring knowing that, yes, they are still investing in, mm-hmm. in newer games into uh, into studios, especially those in Japan. Um, any general thoughts? I'd say it's a, a good thing. They need to re-up that confidence because I, I, I've been with PlayStation since the beginning, man. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Xbox on a consumer-friendly point is leagues and leagues ahead of them in the... The one thing that Sony has in their back pocket is exclusives, and they need to be very much more all-encompassing of all of their studios. Like, if you go to Japan Studios Wiki, they have a, tons and tons of games that you wouldn't even think that they were attributed to, but they had a part in. And losing that Japan side of it is, you know, cutting off an arm and a leg, mm-hmm. in my mind, and giving them less of an up. Because people look at Game Pass and they look at all the consumer-friendly stuff from Xbox and they say, well, maybe I could go with that. I don't need a PlayStation. Yeah, especially on that front, since uh, Xbox historically has not had much um, uh, Japanese support. Like, they've had some stuff here and there, but it's never been a consistent front for them. They, they've definitely been, like, re-upping it on it with um, deals with uh, Yakuza being on Game Pass. I think every mainline game and yakuza is now on game pass which is kind of crazy because that was like such historically a playstation only series and a ton of final fantasy games too apparently also Mm -hmm. uh kingdom kingdom hearts 1.5 and 2.5 and 2.8 are all on game pass and kingdom hearts 3 which is fucking nuts yeah and um... to think even 10 years ago that xbox (laughs) would have these titles unfathomable right yeah yeah, I think honestly. I think even generally this is really reassuring, especially since there is a little bit of a, uh, I would say overblown PR nightmare with like all the Days Gone stuff going out with the um, Naughty Dog stuff, the Last of Us remake, like like Sony's had a bit of a rough go of it in the public sphere, where it's just like yeah they are shoveling their money like into these very few studios. We're gonna get this. We're gonna get fewer, but. I don't want to say bigger as in like open world, but like bigger budget games. But yeah, nice to know there's still going to be a decent uh, quantity, especially since Microsoft's strategy has literally been we are going to buy so many fucking studios. We're going to like obviously games take a while to make all the acquisitions they made even a few years ago aren't necessarily going to come to fruition until still a couple more years down the line. And then you add the fucking Bethesda stuff on top of that. It's like Xbox has a lot of good shit coming their way, so yeah, Sony has to prime up if they want to uh, to win on that front as well. Also, I don't know if it... I, I didn't really think it deserved its own little news story, but uh, Starfield is going to be an Xbox exclusive. So What's Sony Starfield? really... That is the new uh, open world... I, I guess uh, sci-fi open world RPG by Bethesda. Oh yeah, is that the one that's like it's been out for so it's been announced for so long that people for a while were like it's not happening and then the last year they were like no like here's actually a bunch of footage from it. Yeah. And and Sony just doesn't have an equivalent for a lot of that stuff right now actually cuz cuz what they have So they have Starfield now, they're going to have Fallout, Sky Oh, it's Elder Scrolls. When does Skyrim 2 come out? Uh <laughs> uh Prey uh, Wolfenstein, Dishonored. I guess Deathloop is still coming to PlayStation, but but yeah, Microsoft just has a lot of stuff in the ring, and I they even have Obsidian, which like for a lot of people, it's like oh, that's like basically the kind of games you used to go to Bethesda for, but have kind of been shaky lately. Like they're going to be doing Avowed, which basically just looks like Obsidian doing what Elder Scrolls could was like t- ten years ago, but right. like, with modern hardware or whatever. Well, that's the assumption, anyway. Um, well, if the I new th- rumors to be believed, Starfield's going to be a mixture of No Man's Sky and uh, oh, what was it? It was one of those roguelikes, the space roguelikes. Uh, Fast infinite and something. I, th- I like, think even 
I, th- I think even to like push back from that, if we want to do like the tit for tat strategy, it's um, PlayStation does not have anything like those games within their exclusive library, uh, like genre wise or or anything like that. So I think ultimately Xbox is creating an environment where Sony does need to re up, and that w- that is ultimately going to produce. Uh, more games, better games. So I think ultimately, I'm excited to basically play everything that's going to be coming out. Yeah, fairly. I don't have much else to add. Um, I pretty much agree with everything else everyone said. Yeah, but but those two games aren't exactly my thing. But I'm gonna get Deathloop because that game looks really really cool. Is but there something generally about Bethesda games that turn you off, or way that every character stares at you? <laughs> Wait, are we talking Bethesda Game Studios? Or are we talking because Bethesda has Bethesda Game Studios, Arcane, um, Tango Game what Works, kind of cool. <laughs> Machine? Yeah, I really like the like. If we're talking like games that Bethesda have published, I love the Wolfenstein series, like all the new Wolfenstein games, so much. Like they hold a special place in my heart, but like games that bethesda makes i just i try so hard and uh, again it's the way the characters stare at you i'm not a fan of how glitchy they they are and i get that some people call that a feature but it's not let's just be real like i just i'm not a fan that that was bullshit. <laughs> do you do you not yep. enjoy getting yeeted by a giant into the atmosphere no because my favorite story of how i got fucked over was when i first played fallout 4 because a friend let me borrow it and i went to enter a building and in between that half a second that i entered the building and i got shot and my leg got crippled the game auto saved and the auto save broke my game so even if i was able to escape the area and reload my leg was crippled forever wow i could not fix it i restarted my console i cleaned my disc i did everything I'm but my this. right leg was wow. crippled forever. <laughs> oh, and no worries, I, because that's a good just, RP experience, I guess. I just can't <laughs> do it. If you, if you, if you, like, if you like, like fully commit to it, that'd be an interesting playthrough, I guess. Like, well, no, because it literally halved my health. Because you know, once you, I don't know, once you get a leg crippled, half your health is gone. Like, I understand that. That shit is bad, but it's like it was. I just was so angry because I was like, seriously, this is a next gen game and shit like this is still happening. And it's like, they'll release Skyrim 15 goddamn thousand times and it will still be broken and it still won't be fun. Bethesda it, loves money. It, 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 yes, I honestly feel like Bethesda only cares about because they know their fans are going to buy their shit. I rather care about the stuff that the Bethesda game studios are doing, like Arcane, like, like Machine Head. I may not be a fan of the new Doom games because they make me sick to my stomach, literally. But, like, those are cool. Doom Doom guy's nice. I know what you meant, His but you do wonderful. gotta be careful the way you say that because Bethesda Games Studios is literally the name of the developer. Yeah. And oh, Bethesda it is? Bethesda Games is the publisher. So, oh, like, you gotta I didn't specify, know that. like, the studio is owned by Bethesda when you say that. Okay, I'm not trying yeah, I would never no. give a shit about like nomenclature. I honestly don't. I literally mean so that like otherwise people might genuinely have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah. Oh. Um, uh, to, to, to just yeah, go over I, like some of the uh I guess latest games just under that general umbrella, it's uh Ghostwire Tokyo, Deathloop, Doom Eternal, uh Wolfenstein, Rage 2, Elder Scrolls, Fallout, uh Evil Within, Dishonored, Prey. Um, I think that's most of the newer stuff. Yeah, they they have a pretty good uh, diversity under that general umbrella. That's that's not just the um, but that's the game studios proper. I need to replay Dishonored. Waiting for Skyrim PS5 remastered. Do you think they're going to do Skyrim two in VR? <laughs> I already did Skyrim in VR. You can also play Skyrim, Skyrim 2 on your, in VR. Uh, Sequel to Skyrim. On your, on yeah. your smart home product, which El- I have not tried yet. But Elder, Elder Scrolls 7, Skyrim 3. <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> As you say it, they manifest it. All right, I think that's going to go to do it for the show. We're like, actually, damn, we're doing 
by our standards, we are doing pretty good on time. We are only three minutes over. Usually it's Usually far we're more. like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, I just want to go ahead and thank everyone for um, for stopping by, for watching the show, uh, and for supporting us. Uh, I'll just go ahead and do the typical spiel. Um, Game Session Podcast is filmed live here on Sundays at 6.30 p.m. PST. You can find it later on podcast services as well as on YouTube as individually cut up episodes and individually cut up segments and uh, full episodes. Uh, you can support me over on Patreon. I got my link my link tree down below. You can find my Twitter, uh, Twitch, YouTube, blah, 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 wherever you're watching this. It has everything you would ever need down there. Um, everyone's ads are on screen. Their links are going to be in the description. Uh, I just want to go ahead and thank Sarah, Blaine, and uh, especially Raman for being here and uh, hanging out. Anytime. Thank yeah, you. thanks for having I, me, guys. Thank you. I just, I just took a, a liberty of linking those links again to the different uh, pro-Palestine things you can do as far as charity donations, ways to educate yourself, things you can do as far as calling representatives. It's just those four links I just put in the chat. Thank you for that, Blaine. Thank um, you. Any, yeah, any, gen thanks. any general closing statements? Heisenberg isn't a bad person. I mean, he, I mean, he's a bad person, but like, I, I don't want to say the word and get you <laughs> demonetized. <laughs> I don't want to say the word and get you demonetized. That's, it's all good. <laughs> Only people know what I'm talking about. I don't know. I am so far gone, dude. All right, I think that's going to do it. Um, thanks for hanging out, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Take care.